It is 1 a.m. in Washington, 6 in London, and 2 on a Tuesday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gun Young. Here are the top stories making headlines at this hour. A U.S. investigative report has defined the Comfort Women program, Japan's systematic enslavement of women for sexual purposes. President Bakunin addresses world leaders at the nuclear security summit in The Hague. She says denuclearization should first begin on the Korean Peninsula. And the revised telemedicine act for doctors and patients receives the green light from the nation's cabinet, despite pushback from the medical community. We'll have those stories and more, but first, let us begin with this newly released report. It shows that the United States concluded years ago that women were systematically forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. According to diplomatic sources in Washington, the Nazi war crimes and Japanese imperial government records intra-agency working group sent a report over the issue to the U.S. Congress back in 2007. The working group still in operation goes through classified U.S. records to identify war crimes related to the Nazis and imperial Japan. And now over in The Hague, President Park Geun-hye addressed world leaders gathered for the opening ceremony of the Nuclear Security Summit. Focusing on nuclear security, President Park pointed to North Korea, saying that denuclearization should first start on the Korean Peninsula. Our presidential office correspondent Choi Yoo-sun is traveling with the president, and she filed this report from the Netherlands. President Bakune has laid out a systematic plan to enhance nuclear security worldwide. In a four-point proposal made during her opening remarks at the Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague, the president said the international community should take an integrated approach towards nuclear security, disarmament and non-proliferation. She referred to Washington and Moscow's initiative that turned nuclear arms materials into nuclear fuel, saying it was a prime example of turning swords into plowshares. The Korean leader then said there's a need for regional cooperation on nuclear security, such as in Northeast Asia, where 23 percent of the world's nuclear power plants are in operation. President Buck also talked about the need for countries to share technology and experiences to level the playing field. Lastly, she said more measures are required to prevent cyber terror attacks on nuclear power plants. President Buck also made a point of commending international efforts to strengthen nuclear security. She mentioned countries voluntarily allowing the International Atomic Energy Agency to inspect their nuclear material protection systems. She also voiced concern about North Korea's nuclear materials getting into the hands of terrorist organizations and nuclear safety. The South Korean leader used the opportunity to cast light on the dangers of North Korea's nuclear development program. She said a nuclear-free Korean peninsula should be the first step towards a world without nuclear arms. Choi Yusun, Arirang News, The Hague. And staying in The Hague, North Korea's nuclear program was also high on the agenda of summit talks between the leaders of the U U.S. and China in The Hague on Monday. President Barack Obama and President Xi Jinping reaffirmed that North Korea should not be in possession of nuclear weapons and promised to continue close consultations on the matter. While they saw eye to eye on the overall North Korean nuclear issue, the same cannot be said about their stances on resuming the six-party denuclearization talks. Beijing wants to reopen discussions sooner rather than later, while Washington wants Pyongyang to take concrete steps towards denuclearization first before talks can resume. It's been six years now since the last round of six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program was held, and North Korea says the blame for the delay falls on the shoulders of the United States. Heaping pointed words on Washington, the deputy chief of Pyongyang's U.N. mission says the U.S. is keeping the two Koreas from improving relations. Here's our UDN with more. 
North Korea has pointed the finger squarely at the United States for the failed resumption of the six party talks, which are aimed at ending the North's nuclear weapons program. Speaking at a news conference at the United Nations on Monday, Pyongyang's deputy UN ambassador Ri Dong il said the U.S. was using its country's nuclear program as a political bargaining chip. As long as the U.S. is continuing nuclear blackmail against the DPRK, United States should clearly know the fact that additional measures will continue to be taken by the DPRK in order to demonstrate the power of the self-defensive nuclear deterrent. He said the U.S. was to blame for the stalled six-party talks, citing their refusal to meet without preconditions. The six-party talks, which involve China, Japan, Russia, the U.S., and the two Koreas, are aimed at disarming North Korea of its nuclear weapons. The talks have been stalled since late 2008. China has been making a push in recent months to restart the talks, but the U.S. remains insistent that North Korea must first dismantle its nuclear program before talks can continue. Lee also said the United States' refusal to halt annual joint military drills with South Korea are undermining prospects for improved relations between the two Koreas. The latest criticisms follow an accusation on March 14th that the U.S. is setting up a human rights conspiracy against North Korea. That came in response to a U.S. human rights report that called out the North for numerous violations. Yudian, Arirang News. Now, Wednesday, that is tomorrow here in Korea, marks the fourth anniversary of North Korea's torpedo attack on the South Korean warship Tonan, which killed 46 South Korean sailors. Seoul swiftly imposed tough sanctions on the North that proved to have quite an impact on the North Korean economy. But as our Kim Hyun-bin reports, some say it is time that they were lifted. 46 brave souls were lost when the South Korean warship Chunan was sunk by a torpedo attack blamed on North Korea in 2010. Two months later, economic sanctions called the 524 measures were placed against the North that prevent any and all exchanges between the two Koreas. It's not just general trade, it's all processing materials that are banned from in and out of North Korea. The measures had a substantial effect. All cross-border trading came to an abrupt end, with the exception of factory operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex. The amount of exports to South Korea dropped from an average of $41 million a month before the sanctions were put in place to $3.7 million a month afterward to fill the gap. Pyongyang began relying more heavily on China and selling off more of its natural resources. While that has mitigated the effects of the 524 measures, it's had other effects on the North Korean economy. Natural resources are key strategic materials for the North, so it's worth noting that former leader Kim Jong-il banned exports of these products. Citing improving inter-Korean relations, some in the South are now calling for the 524 measures to be lifted. But the South Korea government says that won't happen until Pyongyang takes responsibility for past actions. Regarding the Chonan issue, North Korea says they weren't involved. Pyongyang needs to take responsibility for Chonan and apologize for its actions. So added that North Korea also needs to stop making threats and carrying out provocations if it wants the 524 measures to be lifted. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirat News. Meanwhile, the South Korean government has begun reviewing plans to set up exchange and cooperation offices in Seoul and Pyongyang. An official from Seoul's unification ministry said the government would set aside more than 9 million U.S. dollars in next year's budget, earmarked for building a liaison office in Pyongyang. The total price tag for plans to open offices in the capitals of the two Koreas is estimated at roughly $40 million. Now, the idea actually dates back to the 1990s and was revived in 2012 by President Park Geun-hye when she was running for office. Pyongyang has not publicly responded to the most recent proposal, and President Park envisions the offices as being a bridge to improve economic, social and cultural exchanges between the two Koreas. <laughs> All of the day's important events, 
events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong live from Seoul. Cobalt shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name ECC and the Japanese name C of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. Now to the highly debated issue of telemedicine in Korea. The nation's cabinet passed the revised telemedicine act for doctors and patients earlier this Tuesday morning despite pushback from the medical community. Now telemedicine is clinical care that uses communication technologies such as smartphones and advanced media to remove the need for face-to-face -face consultations between doctors and patients. Well, the government says the change will improve welfare services and lower medical costs. Some doctors say it will diminish their quality of care and thousands went on strike earlier this month in protest. The bill now goes to the National Assembly for a vote. The government hopes the act will go into effect in 2015. Now, we are just one day away now from the official launch of a new political party here in Korea. The new Politics Alliance for Democracy, which will hold an inauguration ceremony Wednesday, was the main topic of conversation at a policy debate forum at the National Assembly this Tuesday morning. Our political correspondent, Kim Young gil reports. The coalition party that will be led by Democratic Party leader Kim Young gil and independent lawmaker An Chol Su aims to bring about an era of new politics. But what is new politics? That was the very title of a policy debate forum at the National Assembly on Tuesday morning. Supporters of the newly formed New Politics Alliance for Democracy Party, or NPAD, joined with academics and lawmakers to discuss the future of the political landscape in Korea. Professor Pang myung Lim of Yonsei University said new politics must start with breaking old political practices. He said the MPAD needs to embrace the ideologies of rational conservatives and introspective progressives. Experts at the forum said the new party should pursue a democratic market economy that promotes fair competition between large conglomerates and small firms. They said a priority should also be placed on building a fair welfare state that helps the people. Professor Moon Jin Young from Seogang University asked that the government make greater efforts to ensure there are no blind spots in the current welfare system. He referred to a recent case in the country where a family of three committed suicide together because of financial hardships. Pandis urged the government to keep President Park Geun-hye's welfare promises that include providing a monthly allowance of some 185 U.S. dollars to all senior citizens over the age of 65. The participants also voiced a need to prepare for a peaceful unification of the two Koreas while also keeping an emphasis on national security and denuclearizing the North. Kim young Arirang News. After more than two weeks of hoping and praying, on Monday all hope was dashed. The relatives of the missing passengers of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 have been told that the ill-fated flight came down somewhere in the remote southern Indian Ocean with no chance anyone survived. On top of that, search operations have been suspended for the rest of the day due to poor weather conditions in the search area. For more on the story, here is our Shin Semin. 17 days of pent-up despair and rage exploded in a Beijing hotel conference room on Monday as relatives of the Chinese passengers on board Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 were given the news many feared, but they didn't want to believe. I want to tell the journalists, the information they just sent, it is not true. In a damning statement given to the media, the families accuse Malaysia Airlines and the Malaysia government and military of being, quote, the real executioners who killed the missing jet passengers. They said the shameless behavior misguided and delayed rescue actions, wasting a large quantity of human resources and materials and lost valuable time for the rescue effort. The angry reaction came after Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak told the world's media Monday that the plane is assumed to have crashed more than 2,000 kilometers west of Australian city of Perth with no chance anyone survived. This is a remote location, far from any possible landing sites. It is therefore 
with deep sadness and regret that I must inform you that according to this new data, flight MH370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. The announcement was based on fresh satellite analysis from Britain, which had employed a type of analysis never before used in an investigation of this sort. Australia says two objects have been spotted and that a naval vessel hoped to recover them soon. The latest in a line of leads stemmed from a French satellite image that showed possible debris in the remote sea southwest of Australia. Despite an extensive multinational search for the missing plane, no wreckage has been retrieved. Shin Semin, Arirang News. The crisis in Ukraine is casting a shadow over the nuclear security summit in The Hague. As the leaders of the G7, that is, the United States, the four major European economies of Germany, France, Britain and Italy, as well as Canada and Japan, all announced they would withdraw from the G8 meeting plan for Sochi and hold their own summit this year in Brussels. They condemned what they called, quote, Russia's illegal attempt to annex Crimea and promised to work together to cut their dependence on Russian oil and gas in the long term. Now, in response, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov shrugged off the snub and the possibility of Russia's expulsion from the alliance as, quote, no great tragedy, adding that Moscow was not, quote, cling to that format. Meanwhile, back in Ukraine, Kiev has ordered its remaining troops and their families out of Crimea in a move effectively seen as a white flag to Russian forces. Now, on a different note, Korea continues to broaden its economic foothold in the ever-expanding European Union. The government will sign an additional protocol to Korea's existing free trade deal with the EU on Tuesday to bring Croatia under the pact. Seoul's trade ministry says the revision of the Korea-EU FTA is in light of Croatia joining the 28-nation trading bloc in July of last year. Korea will provide almost all of the FTA's trade benefits to Croatia with just a few exceptions in the service sector. Korea and the EU signed a tentative deal recognizing Croatia's inclusion last November. Meanwhile, Korea's largest automaker is making a push for a larger stake in the world market. Hyundai Motor is eyeing the U.S. in particular, where the company hopes its highly popular Sonata model will lead the way. Our Kim ji reports. Hyundai Motor hopes the new Sonata will help it fight back a sizable global market share from its competitors, Toyota and Honda. The new Sonata model is the first from the Korean automaker since 2009. It features a hexagonal grille, longer wheelbase, and more ergonic cushion design for seats. Fuel efficiency-wise, the new Sonata can run 12.1 kilometers per liter of gasoline, which is 0.2 kilometers more than the previous model. The price tag ranging between 21 and 28 thousand U.S. dollars, depending on the model and engine size, makes it pricier than its predecessor. Hyundai says the new price reflects a significant improvement in technology and safety features. You get a sense of the premium quality in every detail. It offers a thrilling driving experience not yet seen in other mid-sized cars. The new Sonata is safer and equipped with user-oriented technologies. Since the Sonata model was first introduced in 1985, more than 6.8 million units have been sold, and it remains Hyundai's best-selling model along with the Elantra. The Korean automaker hopes the new Sonata will improve its fortunes. Hyundai Motor and its affiliate Kia Motors had to shell out around 400 million U.S. dollars last year to settle lawsuits in the United States for overstating the fuel economy ratings of their vehicles. Chung bong the head of Hyundai Kia Automotive Group, forecasts the weakest sale growth in eight years for 2014, large part due to the appreciation of the Korean currency. Hyundai Motor says it plans to sell 228,000 new Sonatas this year, 63,000 in Korea and 165,000 overseas. Kim ji Arirang News.
And now it's time for our daily arts and culture segment with our Im Yoon Hee, and she joins me live in the studio. Good afternoon to you, Yoon Hee. Good afternoon. So, um, what do you have for us today? Today, I have a musical based on a legendary character in Korea's history. And now, this performance is by the Seoul Performing Arts Company, and it's very impressive in terms of the uh, quality of the work and its costume. So, let's take a look. It's a story of friendship. <laughs> love and war. Since the days when tribes fought against each other for territory on the Korean peninsula, the story of Sosamu has trickled down through the years. Known as the mother of the crown prince of Koguryo, Sosamu's tale has been told on many different accounts. But here she's the loving partner of Chumong. Sosamu and Chumong meet in their youth while training, preparing to fight for their kingdoms. And instead, a friendship bloomed, one that will later turn into a story of love and support, as Chumong and Sosono become the leaders of Koguryo. There is not a single written piece of evidence of Susano from Koguryo. In fact, the only few sentences that exist are from Pekte, and we've based everything on those few lines. If it's only based on history, all of the stories sound the same, so we've created something new. For example, the white funeral procession flags behind me are usually all white, but we placed a black shroud around it to show a different side to the procession and to the entire story. The Seoul Performing Arts Company isn't new to the art of recreating the historical. Since 1986, they've been producing one-of-a-kind creative works for the stages, both in Korea and around the world. Though it's classified as a musical, their newest production, Sosono, is filled with a never-ending wave of action scenes. The actors fly through the air, sword in hand, as they fight for Koguryo. And there's not a single dull moment throughout the entire performance as the dramatic story of Chumong and his journey to the throne unfolds. Act 2 opens with a war scene where you'll see Chumong's ambitions contrast with Sosono, a motherly spirit. Chumong conjures strength from the ground as he advances forward with his soldiers, whereas Sosono stands from above and leads them with her spirit. Even though no blood is shed in the fights, you can see all the emotions throughout body expressions. It's a story that took place thousands of years ago, and now it's being brought back to life on the stage. But just what happens when there are two people and just one spot for the leader? That's where Sosono and Jumong's son, Yuri, enters the story, and it's up to him to rule the kingdoms. The mystery of Sosono and her exact role centuries ago may never be known. But it's the story of Korea and its people's history, colored by the imagination. You know, Yoon Hee, uh, the story of Sosano, it's, it's a historical story that uh, many, uh, many Koreans are well aware of. But this rendition is just uh, magnificent in scale. Uh, the costumes are just extraordinary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, um, I know that the performance, like you said, is on for a short time only. Yeah, so it's only available at the Seoul Performing Arts Center for uh, throughout this week, and it's going to move on to Chungcheongnam-do province. And the reason being is a Seoul Performing Arts company really makes it a point to share their creative works uh, with Korea, with the rest of the people, and they really do contribute to Korea's art culture with works such as this Hosono. You know, it really amazes me how um, there are so many uh, powerful female figures in Korea's history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think that Korea, uh, Korean females were on the passive side in the Joseon dynasty. But even way before that, there were many, many uh, powerful female figures. And I wonder, you know, if it has any relation to, um, you know, the leader that we have today. Mm -hmm. You know. I asked the exact same question to the director, and uh, she said, interestingly, that she got that question from many others. And she said that, unfortunately, or she didn't actually base this uh, character on our president, but she did uh, say she was pleased to see that so many people recognize our president as a powerful, successful female leader. And, you know, I. Um, 
I'd like to uh, dare to you know speculate that mm -hmm. President Macron herself would get some inspiration from Sosana as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Yuni, for that, and we will see you tomorrow. My pleasure. Good afternoon. It's been rather dull and gray today here in the capital, but we can still look on the bright side. There is no sign of rain in the forecast. The air is clear and it's warm outside. Now for more details, let's shift over to our satellite map. As you can see, it's overcast nationwide. It's currently raining on Jeju Island, and we can expect some precipitation in the southern region as well. Now, going over to our readings, Seoul will top out at 19 degrees in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will peak up to 16 and 17 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island can expect it up to 18 degrees. Dokdo peaks at 17, while Mount Kimgang tops out at 11. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and back to you, Kanyang. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's all for me at this hour. Thank you for watching. I'll be back with Business Today at 4 p.m. Korea time. See you then.